What I would like to see is the kind of a revival that uh, enables people to stop looking at other factors so that we might no longer think that politics can save us. It can't. We can't win the spiritual battle for America's soul through the ballot box. Of course, we should be involved politically. I don't mean that. But it's not as if transformation of our country is going to come through a different Congress or a different president. It would be wonderful if Christians would seek God and seek God alone and remember that if there is any good news in this country, it is going to come from the people of God. I would like to see a revival that causes people to recognize finally that even though we can boycott certain businesses or boycott certain television programs, that at the end of the day, we need something much greater, much more, uh, much deeper in this country in terms of our relationship with God. We cannot fight uh, simply the battles that we are talking about. We can't fight them with worldly methods, however good they may be in certain contexts. So I would like to see a revival that is so genuine that it would have the marks, the authentic marks, of a movement of the Holy Spirit. From time to time we've seen revivals and we have looked at them with some skepticism because we have wondered, is this really the way in which God works? How wonderful it would be to see a revival where there would be reconciliation among families, where there would be brokenness and weeping over our sins. A revival in which we would suddenly find that some of the walls that we have erected between us would be torn down through the ministry and the power of the blessed Holy Spirit. How wonderful it would be to have a revival in which there would be what the Puritans used to call the, the manifest presence of God. I like to refer to the fact that apparently when boats were coming from England to New England, uh, the sailors sometimes repented even when they were on the boat because they knew that they were coming to a place where God was at work. It says in the New Testament that our church services should be held and conducted in such a way that when unbelievers come in, their hearts are exposed. And in their hearts being exposed, they fall on their faces and they say, Surely God is among you. Of course, I'd also like to see a revival that spills over, not just uh, within our churches, but that spills over to the unconverted world. I don't think that I need to tell you that we live in a day and age of great skepticism. The world looks at us and they wonder whether or not uh, what we are doing is really authentic. I remember the story of a woman who walked into a church and she heard all of these marvelous testimonies of God's power. And uh, she stood up and she said, why haven't you people had a God like this before? Well, of course, what people need to do is to recognize that there is a God who actually answers prayer. You know, there are many people in our churches and certainly there are people in the world who honestly believe that there is no God who can be depended upon. There is no God who answers prayer. How can we as a church have an authentic kind of witness to the people of this world unless God so changes us that the world is convinced that God is in the life-changing business. And that's what we as a church have to represent to the world. Of course, I also believe that a genuine spiritual awakening cannot be looked upon as an event. You know, sometimes uh, I'm a little skeptical about revival myself because we think of it as a series of meetings or we think of it as a time when people are turning to God and we forget that the real fruit of revival ultimately is going to have to do with the question of whether or not it lasts. And when I talk about revival lasting, what I mean is this. We need to recognize that a true revival where there is a continuation of what God has begun is always accompanied by good leadership and good teaching. Because you see, as people begin to look at their experiences, that can wear thin after a period of time. And then what they need to do is to recognize that their experience rests on those deep truths of God, truths that must be expounded to people and they must be able to understand them. In fact, I like to sometimes speak on the topic of what to do after you have been revived because there needs to be that understanding that I wake up tomorrow with a new struggle, with a new heart cry, with new difficulties, and with new circumstances. And so I like to think of revival as the tearing up 
of hard ground. As a matter of fact, that imagery, as you know, comes to us from the prophets. He says, tear up the fallow ground. Even though it's been made fallow, tear it up. Now, I know enough about farming to know that just because you tear up the soil, that in itself does not mean that you're going to have a crop. What it means is that there is now the possibility that a crop is going to come. Because at last the soil is uh, torn up in such a way that the seeds are actually to fall into the ground. And now there can be growth. You remember the story about uh, the soils that Jesus told? He talked about many different soils that, that did not have root. And because they did not have root, they actually were soils that did not bear the fruit that God so desperately desires. But Jesus said that that which is sown on the good soil, it is that that brings forth fruit, 40, 60, and a hundredfold. I want to share my burden with you today. And the burden simply stated is this, that what we need to do is to realize that it is through the continuation of teaching discipleship, teaching people to uh, take up their cross and to follow Christ, it is then that the fruits of revival are going to be conserved. It is then that we're going to see a continuation of the very kind of thing that I believe God would like to do among us. And so I conclude today by giving you the challenge that I hope will be a part of your mind and heart and thinking as it is mine. It is simply this. Are we available for whatever God might desire to do among us? Are we open to the possibility that the Spirit of God can do something that is not listed in the church bulletin? Are we willing to think about a God who is greater than our limitations, that if only we trusted Him and obeyed Him despite the cost, perhaps yet, God might do something very special among us. I hope that you share that heart cry for revival because if enough of us share it, pray for it, seek it, we can't demand it. Possibly God in His infinite grace and mercy might give us what we do not deserve, namely refreshment from His holy presence.